This is a subject which uh, is a bit of a Cinderella for architects, or has been for some time. Uh, housing is, or covers, 70% of all urban land. Housing is 40% of our construction output. But house building has been in a serious decline, both in terms of its production and in terms of its quality, for a long time in this country. Recent government pronouncements and pronouncements by other experts claim a need in this country for around four and a half million new houses in the next 10 to 15 years. That's a huge building program. What contribution architects or others in the design profession can make to that is one of the key issues of this debate. In order to start the discussion, we've invited Michael Ball to reflect on this problem because he's just published uh, a fundamental piece of research about housing and the construction industry. Michael Ball is Professor of Urban Economics at the South Bank University and will be known to any of you who've ever studied housing policy and housing theories as one of the major contributors to the debate about both housing production and the housing market uh, in this country and comparatively throughout the world over the past 20 years. The research which was sponsored by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, one of the few places in Britain which still does sponsor effective research on housing, has been a three-year project under the general title of Housing and Construction with six independent projects fitted together uh, looking at different aspects. And the report that uh, we'll be talking about this evening is uh, uh, an overall report that sets out the main arguments uh, and uh, Michael's own particular critique of the construction industry. Uh, copies of the report are available uh, afterwards upstairs uh, when we have the reception. It's the first comprehensive review for many years of the production of housing. Government policies have almost disabled research in this field since the 1970s. There's a culture of mutual distrust in housing construction between different levels of the construction industry and certainly between the design professions uh, and the construction industry. And there's a culture of conservatism, both from the producers but also from the consumers of housing. Architects who've often been fascinated by innovation and particularly by technological innovation have not recently been involved in thinking about housing very much. The market hasn't been there for them, uh, and the production of housing has been done by very other methods. And so part of this debate is part of the beginning of an attempt to open up again the question really what can architects or the design professions offer to what, if any of the predictions are right, will have to be a major program of housing construction. But the way we've organized this evening is to ask Michael to briefly present the key issues of his research, uh, particularly focusing on this question of design and innovation, uh, one of the big uh, holes that he found in housing production, and then to invite three different voices to comment on that as a starting point for uh, a debate. Uh, I'll introduce them in more detail later when we move to that part of the debate, but the three voices are Bernard Hunt from Hunt Thompson, also uh, the uh, chair of the RIBA Housing Group, Sunan Prasad from Pranoya and Prasad, with a long history of involvement in housing design, and Cedric Price, who I'm sure is well known to most people here, who's been thinking innovatively in all directions for so long that uh, one doesn't need to try and list them. So uh, we'll, I'll introduce them in more detail later on, but we'll start now with Michael. Thank you. Um, one of the joys of coming to the Architectural Association is you get such a good plug at the beginning of your talk. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, Hugo. Um, but um, I just want to make three sort of brief introductory points before getting into the meat. 
Um, but I'm treating this as, I know we're all going to get hungry during the course of this talk, but I'm treating this as a bit as an after-dinner talk. So let's hope we get a little informal and get down to some of the meaty issues. And I'll be a bit of um, an architect hounder, if, you, if um, you'd like, just for the purposes of debate. Some of my best friends are architects after all. Um, anyway, um, the, the three observations are, um, the thing I don't think I'm going to have to do much this evening is convince people that the house building industry and the repair and maintenance industry of housing in this country um, aren't quite up to modern technology as it exists in other countries, let alone at the leading edge of technology. Now, you, um, this is very easy. I've done quite a few um, uh, talks and discussions um, in the media as well as elsewhere about this, and the only people that don't seem to know it are the builders themselves. They say we build a handcraft product. Isn't that what you all want? Handcraft shoes, whatever it is, have a handcraft house. And there aren't any problems that are of our making. Um, but I don't have to go too much into the, the problems of house builders, but more into the way in which house builders interrelate with architecture, which is going to be one of the themes um, of my talk. You could say, well, he's not going to say much, is he? Because there's not much interrelation. But it's about what the potentials are, I think, that are most important. The second thing I think it's important to be aware of is that um, there's this myth that's been around for a very, very long time that nothing changes in the house building industry. That is actually a line from a poem by Rudyard Kipling written in about 1890 something or other. Um, and um, it's a, it's, in other words, it has a long longevity. I'm not a really young Kipling fan. I just happened to do some research on housing history once and found this little line tucked in an article somewhere. Um, but um, it's a pre prevalent view. It's always been prevalent. And perhaps it's more unfair to blame architecture, uh, Victorian builders for not changing technology than it is from late 20th century British builders because they're, obvious, they're obviously throughout the history of house building been very substantial technical changes. Traditional methods, as with most things, are about 20 years old. Um, and um, that is as true of house building as it is with most other activities. So it's not a question of saying that nothing changes, it's the speed of change, the speed of adaptation, which is the thing that I want to focus on. The final thing I wanted to say was that Roundtree funded six projects um, um, to look at house building and various aspects of it. And it wasn't just the building, it was the repair and maintenance as well. So to an extent, um, the report um, that we're that I wrote and um, some of the, the findings that I'm discussing are actually the work of other people um, within the broader product team rather than myself. Okay, now um, to um, have a little sort of label for the house building industry, I'm an economist, so I'm going to do an economist speak, um, but I, I sound more like a financial journalist actually than an economist when I do this perhaps, but it's a little phrase which says that house building in the UK is relatively low productivity industry. It's a relatively high cost industry and it has incredibly low levels of investment in its production techniques. Just to give you an example of this, if you look at the statistics that come out of the government, um, the average worker who drives to work probably in a rather beat, hand, beat up second hand car to the house building site will then during the day use capital equipment which is worth less than that beat up car. Now just imagine most forms of factory production just see the transformation of British industry where um, the ratio of capital equipment to workers has gone up three times in the last 15 years. It hasn't changed in house building. Similarly, if we look at repair and maintenance, what we see within repair and maintenance is that um, the um, tools um, if, uh, that are used by most repair and maintenance workers will be worth less than the value of the, the average TV set. Okay? It's a very, very labor-intensive industry. Sorry, handicraft industry. Um, and uh, obviously, as a result of that type of production, um, we get high costs. And um, uh, the reason why we get high costs isn't just simply that it's labor intensive, but from the way that labor's used, the management systems, the types of materials that are used and the lack of searching out of alternatives. 
and the inability in a whole variety of ways to use modern techniques. Now, one of the things I want to raise tonight, because I think it's very, very important, is technology isn't simply a physical thing. It's fundamentally a human thing and a management um, type of exercise. So when we look at technology and house building, this is much about the way in which it is organized or not organized as in terms of the style of the physical things that go up to make a house. And I include within the physical things the physical plan, the design. All these things have to merge together, but we must be um, very much aware that we're not simply talking about technology in the Le Corbusier sense of something that's going to go up in the air and boom, that's it. How do you create these things? What are the nature of the mechanisms which generate that thing we call housing? <coughs> this is the um, important aspect. Now, as I said, I'm not going to talk too much about the, the actual technical capabilities of the house building industry in the UK, but there have been studies, some of them were a part of this Roundtree project, which have looked at house building in other countries. Not surprisingly, people who live in other countries look at their own house building industries, but there have been lots of comparative studies as well. Now, what do those comparative studies show? The UK, in terms of most advanced economies, isn't very good. Now, it's not good in two senses. In the senses I've used before, the technical level and the way in which investment takes place and innovation takes place, but it's also not very good in terms of its ability to respond to quite sharp changes in demand, even with the techniques it's using. And what's the problem here? Well, the problem here basically is that if you're using labor-intensive methods, you need a skilled labor force that can use those labor-intensive methods. Some countries rely on technologies where they can haul in and out of the industry unskilled workers in quite an easy, effective way. But in Britain, handicraft techniques prevail, bricklayers, carpenters, and so on. And they're always in short supply. Every time the housing market picks up, not surprisingly, other building markets pick up, the commercial markets, office buildings, shops, and so on. And so what we find, as soon as there's a turn up in the housing market, there's nobody to build houses. You get, end up with a situation of a chronic shortage of building labor. And that's what we find in the 1990s. Despite very considerable increases in certain forms of training within the 1980s, high unemployment within the 1990s has discouraged people from entering the industry as a, uh, to join the trained labor force and has obviously encouraged an awful lot of people to exit the industry because you can't have sustained employment. So not only have we got a, an industry that to a certain extent is locked in a low productivity trap, it can't even get the workers to undertake those techniques. So what we will find, as soon as there's pressure to build more houses, and pressure is slowly building up, there's lots of sold signs around London, for example, and somebody somewhere is going to um, worry about the housing conditions of uh, lower income groups and slightly greater em um, enthusiasm than the current government does over the next few years. And when these pressures start to build up, and Hugo already mentioned that household projections are also likely to increase very, very substantially in the midterm, how are we going to build the houses? Well, the basic answer to that is we're not going to build the houses. We'll build some houses, but what we'll mainly see is rising costs, rising costs of the, sh of the skilled labor that's around, um, which will trickle over, of course, into the rest of the construction industry, but also rising costs for home users and homeowners. Housing is going to get more expensive in the, mean term, in, in, in the medium term. And this is a basic um, failure of technological advancement. Look what's happened to computers. Look what's happened to cars. In fact, industries that use um, assembly techniques and design um, bespoke things uh, which aren't construction have also seen very substantial increases in the methods that, uh, f uh, that they use in investment and therefore a lowering of cost. Housing is now beginning to stand out as one of the consumer durables whose production costs persistently rises over time, whereas we see dramatic falls in others. So what we might end up with paradoxically over the next two decades is a, a very um, odd form of housing poverty 
it's too expensive for virtually everybody to get what they want. People will move out of housing and um, consume other things as a result. Now, this will have very substantial implications in terms of how we see our cities, um, because city structures are bound to change as a result of this. And unfortunately, one of the cheap ways of building houses is to whack them up on greenfield sites. Um, this is of the common way, for example, in North American cities. So um, as a result of high cost housing, we'll probably see greater um, pressure to um, expand the shape of our cities. We'll see our inner urban areas suffering from very considerable housing and social decay as a result. So it's not just a problem for architects, it's not a problem for, uh, for housing um, studies people in, in general, or even for those concerned with housing policy. It's fundamentally going to affect the way we live our lives. And it will particularly affect, of course, those who cannot afford um, to in improve their situation. So that's the nature of the problem, a long-term drain in terms of innovation in house building. But um, and I could, in fact, go on to about a few other problems. Um, just think about the nature of the uh, um, homes we have these days. Um, London's a classic example of where traditionally built houses, now I said traditional is very variable, so this is um, 19th century traditionally built houses, um, have been incredibly adaptable. Um, they, many of them were originally built for um, middle class households. Many of the speculative de developments failed, so they turned into rooming houses, which are incredibly overcrowded and then in the 60s and the 70s they all got gentrified and turned into nice um, or reasonably nice spacious homes for middle class groups again. Um, but what we see within that context is that those structures were incredibly flexible. You could do lots of different things with them. With modern houses you haven't got that flexibility. They are targeted and designed for a particular group. Now modern houses aren't supposed to last forever but we don't demolish homes in the UK. Um, if we continue building at the current rate we're building, the average house will have to last for 4,000 years. <laughs> I'm no expert on housing history, but that's probably an awful lot longer than any house has ever managed to live. And we're talking about Barrett and Wimpy starter homes here. And uh, so um, um, uh, just uh, think of your... Um, the people in the dim distant future thinking what a strange century that was. Anyway, um, these are a whole set of issues then about the nature of the product and where we're going um, um, in terms of housing. Now, what about architects within this context? Well, I think there are um, a few things that we can see have happened and a few things that we can see that should happen that aren't happening. Now, obviously, um, uh, we've seen in the medium term, architects have, um, um, to a certain extent, voluntarily removed themselves, and to a certain extent, involuntarily removed themselves from what was once a very important role within housing. Now, architecture has never had much sway within um, what's been called speculative building from the 19th century onwards. In other words, um, builders building for the private market, book patterns and um, slightly more up-to-date versions of book patterns have predominated within the private housing sphere. But during the period of mass public house building of the 50s and the 60s, architects had more sway. In fact, unfortunately for architects of today, the architects of those days claim they actually had more sway than they did. Um, in other words, a lot of the problems of, of housing have I think, unreasonably been blamed on architects. Uh, concrete panel systems, which were in no sense designed by architects, are told by um, everybody um, who, who, who vaguely knows something about housing, will tell you, oh, well, look what happens when you get architects building things. You get those pointy things that stick in the air and so on, um, that nobody likes to live in, the, the, the um, uh, systems building of the 50s and the 60s. There was some architectural input into to it, but it, it was um, a very, very minor thing, but architects got blamed for that. But it was part and parcel of prevailing architectural ideology at the time about the nature of technical change. So even though they weren't in the driving seat, if they had been in the driving seat, would we have actually seen um, something much, uh, much different? As a piece of history, perhaps we can squabble about later on. 
Now, um, problems of council house building in the late 60s and 1970s led to a situation of massive cost overruns. And within this context of massive cost overruns, architects were of, um, often the leading project manager. The nature of the building system in those days, in modern speak, made them the project manager. They managed how sites work. They had to have the battles over who um, um, determined a cost overrun. Was it design change? Was it a, an act of nature? Or was it just straightforward incompetence by the builder? All these sorts of management tools and activities were in the remit of the architect. And frankly, if you look back at the history of um, building in this time, when um, if you look at building as a whole, but um, um, public and social housing almost in total, when it was architect managed, it wasn't managed very well. Cost overruns were phenomenal, often running two or three times the original product cost. And if a project came in at only twice the length it was supposed to do, that was a success. Now, um, uh, to a, to, to a, a res, as a result of that, and we've seen in other parts of the building industry, and it's also happened within what remains of social housing, which is now minuscule compared to what it was in the 60s and 70s, what we um, see is that architects have been pushed out of a management role. Now, I think this is not only a loss for the architectural profession as a whole, because obviously it's a sphere of expertise and activity and influence, which is vitally important, but I think it's a loss for the users of housing, for the innovators within housing, because the key design input has become more peripheral. Just imagine tooling up a new car without talking to the designer, okay? But that's what we get in the house building industry. Um, just imagine the nature of the changes that you get in modern cars. And again, the designer plays a key role, aware of the technology, but also influencing the developments that can take place within that technology. And by the very nature of the interaction between design and management, influencing the organization of the way in which it's built. Design, in other words, isn't the kingpin, but it's an important linchpin within the whole process of production. And one of the problems of, of architects being pushed out of housing is that that linchpin has been lost. Now, there are a couple of other things I could say, but I'm, I've only got down to about point three, and I thought Hugo had nicked half of mine, um, so I better speed up a bit. But the essential thing that I want to talk, um, want, want to emphasize is that there clearly is a situation where we've got problems in housing and where our, the, the, the design role and the professionals within the design role have been, um, by a whole variety of, 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 of method, methods, pushed out. Now, Turning to speculative house building, what can we, uh, I've already mentioned that the role of the architect within speculative housing, house building tends to be rather limited. It might be some advice on getting the initial plans for a very standardized housing type together, but extent, extent, essentially we get boxes with little lumps stuck on them, and boxes, as I pointed out, that are relatively inflexible. Now, what um, I would ask of the architecture profession, of which there's, um, um, and in other words, ask of the audience here is, why is it that house builders have managed to avoid using architects? It's like clothes producers thinking that they can merely copy designs, perhaps? Is that the sorts of thing that goes on? Or is it that there's something about housing where the design element is actually rather peripheral? In most other consumer durables, design has become so important. Why hasn't it become more important for housing? Um, it's, it's a question that you have to ask yourself, because it's very easy to say that speculative house builders go for the cheap. They probably do. They want to make profits. But why do consumers? Why isn't there the added benefit of design that consumers get? Now, the... Um, Second issue um, that I wanted to raise is that, um, as I noted before, design cannot be separated from execution. Now, what mechanisms, if there were a, a revival of the relationship of the architect with the design of house building, could we um, think of? What would be the new linkages? Would it just simply be the professional standing apart saying, here's my drawings, I've listened to all the parties, now you get on with it? 
Um, or would there be a bigger integration between the professions and therefore a ways of thinking about innovations? Um, we often hear about the Japanese model um, within these types of things. I don't think the Japanese have a monopoly on these types of cooperative interrelationship. They often, to the outsider, seem sensible, but to the insider seem impossible. I don't understand. Now, the um, one other um, aspect that I think is um, very, very important is then um, to raise the question that it's not simply about design that's the problem in the sense of design as technology. It's not simply the question of, of, of um, possibly the cooperation between the various people in the industry. There's another big issue here, of course, and that's the nature of the way in which we run our housing system within Britain. This is a much more general policy-oriented thing, but it's a policy-oriented thing which tends to get emphasis from the demand side, looking for people in need. How do consumers get satisfied? That's the game that politicians play with housing policy. But politicians don't play the game of the supply side when formulating housing policy. Now again, why is this? Most other manufacturing industries, most manufacturing industries get their ore in. The farmers, as we've seen um, so spectacularly over the last few months, um, get half a hoof and a couple of horns and anything they can into the works and um, lead to very major, almost structural breaks within the political tradition, um, for example, in relationship to Europe. The supply side within housing policy is never gets heard. Why is that? Is this, um, again, um, the fact that, that perhaps architects emphasize the design too much and don't recognize that they have a wider public role and that they can actually influence governments in the way in which they think? Now, those are some of the issues I've talked about. Now, what I've not talked about is actually to be fair to people within the house building industry, Britain does have a peculiar problem the volatility of house building in this country is probably the highest of any of the major countries in the world. It's very difficult to get accurate data for Italy, so I have to say probably the highest. Um, uh, but um, there are no, um, um, many countries that have much, much lower volatility. Um, fluctuations in house building rates um, in Germany, for example, are about um, a third of those in, in the UK. In France, they're a quarter. They're even less in um, that classically volatile country of uh, free market capitalism, the United States. The British house building industry has a particular problem of volatility. I might add it's much, much greater than for other sectors of the construction industry as well. So is this one of the reasons? Is it just simply that you can't build up continuing relationships that affects the way in which architecture as a profession links into house builders as the producers? I've thrown these questions up because um, I was told to create a debate. So um, what I'm saying in summary is it's not just technology. It's not just design as technique. It's very much part and process of a social organization. And with that um, little soundbite, I, I rest my case. Thank you very much. Great. Well, that's certainly thrown out uh, some things for us to, to chew on, and I'm going to ask uh, our three respondents now if they'd like to come up to join us at the table. And we try and uh, open up the debate simply by asking each of them to make a first uh, response to that, but then to open it immediately to everybody else and see how we go from there. Uh, and the three respondents are, are Bernard Hunt, who uh, is a partner in Hunt Thompson, who has a long track record uh, in housing and into inter intervening in very difficult problems of, of housing in the cities. Uh, but he's also chairman of the RIBA housing group, who have been in the news recently as part of the millennium fever that we all seem to be hooked into at the moment, because they've put in a bid for 50 million, which is peanuts, really, compared with most of the millennium stuff. But the interesting thing is that they're proposing that through that, 2,000 prototype houses should be built involving the RIBA, involving architects, in demonstrating, as it were, that there are very different and better ways in which architecture and the production of housing could interrelate. Um, 
So that's really quite a, a major uh, uh, proposal. Um, there should be a conference next year that will bring together some of those ideas. And assuming the funding goes ahead, well, Bernard can tell us what, what might happen uh, then. Uh, the second respondent is Sunand Prasad from Panoya and Prasad, a practice which has a long involvement in housing design, but also in innovation in design in the, in the best sense of the word, not getting hooked on some sort of techno technocratic sort of fix, but actually looking very hard at materials, at the use of materials, but also about creating new sorts of spaces uh, and the way in which uh, we must think about how people actually use space. Uh, uh, so it's a, a long uh, record of innovation in design. Recently also been involved in an interesting uh, type of exhibition uh, at the RIBA based around the theme, how did they do that? Which attempts to explain, not for architects, but for other people, how a building is actually commissioned, how discussions are developed about what the building uh, should, should try to do, what it should be made of, the whole process of the production of it. And the exhibition follows through the production uh, of a building uh, and is part of a series at the RIBA to try and open, open up the architectural profession more to other people understanding how buildings are actually made. Uh, and thirdly, Cedric Price, who's been thinking about design and technology and construction for a very long time. I was uh, amused and impressed to see that he's now proposed uh, to become grade two star listed, not Cedric himself, but uh, a, an, an early building that he did with Frank Newby, the, uh, Newby, the, the um, aviary in London Zoo, in this bizarre attempt by the government, uh, I don't know when they're trying to win votes about it anyway, they've started listing modern buildings, and Cedric's building is one of the few that starred as well as being great. <laughs> it's embarrassing, Cedric, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned it. More interestingly, <laughs> More interesting, he just published the Magnets uh, project, which I'm sure most of you have seen, which is exactly uh, that sort of um, trying to think things uh, in a different way, which is so important in this sort of debate. So if I could ask you three to come so that uh, you can use the microphones, uh, and to start with Bernard making a comment. So Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, we had, we had a brief discussion um, before um, this meeting about the use of the word architecture in relation to housing. Um, my, my feeling is that what I would call vernacular housing sets a very good model for us. Um, exactly what do we mean by vernacular? Well, maybe 18th and 19th century um, terraced housing in London um, but the development of um, rural housing through the ages, really, um, which has achieved in what survives a very high quality, um, which I think we agreed might be called architecture, but architecture without the involvement of one individual in coming up with all the, um, the ideas which lie behind it. And I would suggest to you that evolution is rather a good, um, Darwinian evolution is rather a good concept for housing. Um, and I would suggest to you that innovation should be seen in that, in that context. That we need ideas to come through, we need different ideas to be constantly coming through and being tested. And um, we must accept that when there are new ideas, some of them flourish and some of them wither on the vine. So that, that's one first thought. Um, a second thought is the cars and computer model that we talk about. Because I think there is dramatic evidence over the last 30 years, but going back further than that, of industries which produce dramatic leaps in the quality of their product, um, at the same time reducing real reductions in cost. And uh, the motor car industry is, is an impressive example of that, and the computer industry is, is a totally spectacular example of how human 
invention, uh, coupled with um, a lot of other things, have resulted in this, in this achievement of massively improved quality um, whilst reducing cost. I was hoping that it might be possible to invite this evening um, somebody called John Miles, who, who's, who's um, the technology director at Ovarabs, who spoke recently on the subject, um, where is the Henry Ford of future housing systems? And he was, he was saying, well, look, the car model is the model that we should take for housing. And he was saying, if we were able to follow the car industry, we would be bringing down our costs and we would be dramatically improving our quality. But he, and, and I think, particularly at the AA, I, I feel that an international school of architecture, and this is one of the, probably perhaps the leading international school of architecture, the challenge is terrific because um, of the growth of the cities. And he was talking about the number of cities that are going to um, have a population of 20 million is going to double over the next 10 years, something like that. It is quite mind-boggling. There is a huge global market for housing. Don't forget that. And uh, when we look at computers and we look at cars, we're also talking about global markets. Don't let's be too parochial in our thinking. But he also um, brought us down to earth a bit by saying that, um, by quoting the figure uh, that it cost Ford to bring the Mondeo, you may have seen the Mondeo around, it's a Ford model, it cost five billion pounds to bring in research and development and marketing costs to bring the Ford Mondeo to the market. In order to get, and that is of course, you may say when you drive your Mondeo that it isn't that much better than the previous Ford, but that is the kind of investment that is going into um, producing serious improvements in quality. Um, I think he was quoting figures of the, between three quarters and one and a half billion pounds for the plant to produce a major motor car. Uh, and he was quoting over a billion pounds to uh, bring the, the uh, Vauxhall Vector to market. So I think we've got to say, well, when we're, when we're talking about these other models, it, it's possible to imagine that the investment costs are going to be very significant. I'd, I'd like, I mean, I'm personally, you know, I, I'm, I'm fed up with all the pessimism that goes around. Everyone says the world's getting worse, housing design's getting worse, everything's getting worse. Uh, basically, I think the evidence is, is to the contrary. I think the world is steadily getting a better place all the time. And I, I'm a great believer in the sort of processes that are bringing um, improvements to cars and computers. So if you're not, we're going to part company here. Um, I think consumer power is a very potent force. And I think architects find it hard to live with because it isn't just a question of, of saying people ought to like what we do. It's a question of us coming up with ideas that are going to inspire people that are going to perform better. And to my mind, that is what's happening with um, designers who are involved in cars, is they've got, to, they've got to score at every single level. The performance characteristic of those cars have constantly got to improve. The statistics have got to improve. The cost has got to come down. And at the same time, the inspiration that people get, people actually buy cars because they're inspired by them not because of just things like simple performance. Are we capable, as a profession, of inspiring people with houses? Oh, well, it's going to cost too much, so let's give up. Well, OK. We'll go out of the field altogether. It is up to architects to improve performance, reduce cost, and inspire people with stretch their lives. That's what we want to be able to do. But if we can, if we can do that with, with housing, if we can significantly improve the quality of people's lives, then everybody's going to beat a track to our door. And if we can't, and if we decide it's all too difficult and that people ought to do this and people ought to do that, but they won't, then we're finished. And I, I think it will start with housing and it will go on to other areas. 
So that is the territory on which we've got to compete. We've got to compete for customers. In housing in this country, we have a situation where there is zero competition for customers. We have, in brief, a social sector and a private sector. And um, somebody called David Coleman, who I think has got some rather interesting ideas, summed it all up in the social sector where houses, new houses now are only being built by housing associations. He said, housing associations compete for grant, they do not compete for customers. They compete for the money from the housing corporation, the government, whatever it is, to do their projects. There is no competition between housing associations for tenants. Compare that with the car industry and the computer industry. And I had a very interesting meeting with one Roger Humber, who runs something called the House Builders Federation, which represents all the house builders. And he said almost exactly the same words. He said, um, in the new house market, um, house builders compete for land. They do not compete for customers. That is the way this market operates. There is virtually no competition. Once you've bought a site, you are the only new housing to be built in that area. That is to do with the way that we deal with um, land sales in this country. We have this long tradition of speculative housing development. Um, it's worth just for a second snapping out of it and remembering that this isn't the way the world goes around, it's just the way the world goes around in England. What we see outside here is a brilliant example of speculative housing development. It it's, comes from a tradition in this country of very large land holdings um, being handed down to the eldest son, not getting broken down into millions of little bits, and it's led to the fact that um, the people who put up new houses in this country always put up um, a lot of the same house. They always have done here, and they did it rather well here. They've done it less well as time has gone by, but that is the tradition. Um, it isn't the same in other countries, and I've, I've recently come back from a trip to Japan where um, I visited one industrialized housing um, company which was producing 70,000 um, units, 70,000 houses every year, which is approximately half the total UK housing output. And you would imagine that they were going to put these onto huge sites like we do and build rows of them, particularly since they're industrialized. Of course, they're all going to be standardized, aren't they? No. Each one of those houses, 70,000 of them, was sold to an individual customer. They started with a standard um, concept and they spent months with each customer producing a completely customized product. And I went to see the production lines and as the thing comes through, each particular aspect of that house is custom made. Now, to my mind, I'm not saying that the houses that are coming off the production lines in Japan at the rate of one a day, it takes them a day to build a whole house in a factory in Japan to individual customer requirements. I'm not saying they're wondrous, but I'm just saying that if we start to work and interact with people on this sort of scale, then there really is an opportunity for architects. And if we don't take that opportunity, if we're not up to it, if we don't like working with builders and we don't like working with manufacturers and we think that we've got it all in our head, it's a question of <laughs> us going away and coming up with a brilliant idea and then someone else can go away uh, and do it. Well then, there isn't going to be a future for us. Two things that we're doing at the RIBA, briefly. One is we propose something called housing value assessment which is basically saying, let's have some performance measurements for what a house actually does. Because at the moment, we're talking about value for money, but nobody can actually compare one, one house with another. They can with a car, and they can with baked beans, but they can't with a house because there are no measures. And we don't even, we don't even tend, consumers don't even tend to know what the uh, number of square meters of their house is. So we've proposed a comprehensive a schedule, a methodology for measuring the performance of houses. And um, to, to my considerable surprise and, and delight, this idea has been picked up by 
the Housing Corporation and the Department of Environment um, has gone through a successful feasibility study and is likely um, to go on to an implementation stage next year um, and to become introduced um, into the social housing sector within two years from now. So I think once we have some objective criteria to measure by, um, architects are going to be able to show what they can do, that we can actually deliver better performance. Secondly, um, the, the 2000 Homes project, Millennium project, where this goes back to this idea of evolution. We've got to bring forward new thinking. We are living in a culture of mediocrity. We are living in a, a system which encourages the lowest common denominator, as I've um, explained in both the social and the private sector, because the customer doesn't have a voice. Because individuals don't figure. It's just the mass that is driving the whole thing. The 2000 Homes Project is designed to um, encourage innovation um, that will show the way in which housing design can offer a better quality of life than it does at the moment and do it at lower cost. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. We'll move straight on to Sunan. Um, I see that the, the, the uh, title is uh, Housing Construction, Is There a Future for Architecture? Um, and it wasn't called Is There a Future for Architects? Which is presumably because a very large number of architects are involved in uh, housing construction, producing a guaranteed architecture-free product. And that, of course, isn't quite the same for schools of architecture. <coughs> and if uh, all of us here, anybody who's thinking hard about this, could actually find a way of producing a house, say a five or six person house, which suited a variety of ways of living, which was about 150 square meters, 120 square meters, rather than you know, t 90 or uh, 85 square meters for an average family dwelling, and if they could build it for 400 pounds a square meter, 450 even, then regardless of what it looked like, you know, in this so-called conservative and you know, innovative, innovation-fearful country, they would sell it. And the reason we can't do it is actually we don't even know what's involved as architects and students. We don't even, we are actually in one of the most intensively divided labor industry industries that there is. I think it's a bit difficult to comp compare ourselves with computers and uh, cars. I think that you know, bicycles and other household goods might be better comparison, or ships, you know, which are, you know, houses cost several times annual wages. It's very difficult. You know, I think probably 10 times an annual wage is the cost of a house nowadays. Very difficult to make those sort of comparisons. But one thing you do notice is that there is no other consumer durable, which interestingly I, Michael called a house to be, but I never thought of it as a consumer durable, but if it is a consumer durable, then there's certainly no other which is produced. Well, 4,000 years is too long. Well, <laughs> <Pretty> durable. <laughs> very durable. <laughs> consumer, very durable. There's no other industry in which one organization thinks up what it might look like. Another organization pay, pays for that. Another organization actually builds it and musters the labor and the materials and yet other organizations are involved in producing their own bits. It, it is, it, and it, I think architects especially seem to revel in this. They've distanced themselves from how, uh, and especially schools of architecture since we are in one, distanced themselves from how houses are actually put together, what it takes to make things, how much things weigh, how much a brick weighs, how much aluminum weighs, and whether that's important or not. Uh, they don't, and they certainly don't know anything about cost. It's absolutely, it doesn't even begin to feature on the agenda of, a, of schools of architecture, that, how much things cost. It's not the case with other product design. It's not the case for cars. If we knew, we, and by doing that, we've only weakened ourselves as architects. We've only ceded all ground to other people who, whose work we don't like, and we feel very superior to them because all they can do, because that is all they know how to do, is to put veneer vernacular veneers in a desperate attempt to actually hold together things that don't work. And these veneers actually, I think, are probably about to crack. And 
uh, we've got very short time in which to learn all these other things to make a real contribution. Very nice. Um, right, last thing, try and <coughs> I agree with a great number that was said by the first two speakers. Now if I just make one or two points that haven't been covered yet, there still seems to be some, both by the main speaker and by the contributors, some division between um, uh, one's own pig pen, national feelings, and, and the global situation. And I think this may be uh, the, f the fault uh, that we have in determining the, the strengths and the shortcomings of the house production as we know it. Uh, Ford has, has no, to take the car thing, Ford has, has no barriers, international barriers, but neither does Big Pens, uh, the ballpoint pen. Uh, and to a certain extent, neither do shoe manufacturers, be they trainers with, with uh, speed whiskers on the edge or anything else. And um, that has happened comparatively quickly. My uncle left me his fountain pens, believe it or not, you know, and it wasn't meant to be a joke. So the, from, from actually an object such as a pen, and these are cheap ones, not cars or anything, such as a pen or shoes, I've still got my father's shoes, um, I just keep them, but I mean, I still look at them and think, but <laughs> the, the, so what I'm, I'm saying is that it may be that, that over and above a, a house is an expensive product, that's fine, and sometimes there are consumers, and sometimes it's provided as a service. Um, housing in this country was run by the Ministry of Health after, after the war, after the last war, or our last war, not so ever since, 39-45 war. Uh, the, the housing was, and, and there was no private housing because every bit of material had to be licensed, and it was run by the Ministry of Health as an alternative to people being ill. Now we build hospitals and, and sell houses. So it, it wasn't long ago when it was seen as, as a service. Now, no one asks um, a widow to wear her old man's false teeth, in, even in this depleted national health service. <laughs> but, 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 but no, but pound for pound, false teeth are more expensive than houses. Pound weight, pound cost. They are, because I've worked that out as well. <laughs> so what it? So um, it may be that that uh, there, there is um, a sort of a blurring of 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 service and product, which is also related to consumer delight and and um, citizen expectation. You see, I mean, we are being charged for air and water and things at the moment, but it's only an aberration. It's only in a silly offshore, greedy island of Europe. So, I mean, it's what is happening to us that fact was a slight sort of move backwards in, in, in a few seconds of, of global time doesn't matter. Generally speaking, there is a change, and the reason why there's a change between what one thinks, ah, oh, I'll buy that, and what one thinks, ah, oh, they should offer me that, like votes for women and all that. No one's fighting for those anymore. But, but um, is, is funny enough related to the, not only the expectation of, of the eventual situation in life, but the fact that the, there is not an expectation for the same eventual situation in anyone's lives. That is, there's far more division in all, all, um, all races, we use that word, like Europeans and things, between ageism and, and all the things that we used to think divided people, like social class or money or poverty. Or, or nationality. Ageism is becoming, and I think it's a good thing, that, that, but it's becoming far more, it, it is being measurable as a consumer uh, demand that, that uh, I might be, uh, may be exaggerating, that I'm seldom known to do that. It may be that, that buying a house, having a house, it will be rather a young person's 
thing to do, not something you mortgage the happiness of your family for the whole of your life in order to own. That, that, that it might be because they, there is a mobility and a mental mobility in working and not working and where you work and it doesn't matter too much about the, um, the uh, languages used by the consumer, the product you're producing. And no one, no one, uh, they, they don't teach English, and they should probably do in Taiwan, but that's because they, they can become uh, airline pilots, not because the people will, will understand the names written on the side of the biro, which you throw away when it, when it runs out. So, in fact, the how we might be sort of investing the house, not with um, an unnatural, we might be investing it with the wrong age, the wrong age during which it lives. Coming back to the weight business that you mentioned, the whole business about weight and occupancy, it's unlikely, ex apart from the Dutch and Norman Foster with his airport. But generally speaking, we're not changing the land that is available, but the population is increasing and increasing. So um, the, the business of, of, of getting a, a lean-to uh, greenhouse halfway up Everest, it's probably going to be quite worthwhile conditioning that area in order to get that land. So the land and the product that you put on the land and the weight of that product are more and more going to be seen as uh, um, not needing to be compatible. And why do housing and land not need to be compatible? Because of the life of the house. Not because necessarily you can move it, but just because, just like crops, no one says, oh, it's autumn, and they look at a tree, all the leaves have fallen off, or an old, old-fashioned tree, its leaves have gone. <laughs> You know, there, there, there's an assumption there'll be something that causes uh, another demand. Now, in, in, if we're taking this, this pig pen of a country, um, there's, there's four million talked about, four million houses needed in the next 20 years. It might be the next 10 years, doesn't matter. Oh, five million, that's right. But three and a half million are for single ownership. Now, so don't even as architects think what it was like to have, have home and your brothers and sisters and your mother and father again, and I like the dining room table or I like the idea of my little bedroom which I can lock with my television set inside and my computer and things, because it ain't going to be that sort of person who is the, the consumer of the house. Three and a half million of a single person, single person occupancy. Not one woman families or one father families or whatever, not, not all that. So, so in fact, it's already moving into not sharing a, your false teeth with your old man. You, you know, that, that is the thing, and it is the time and, and the sheer weight of numbers, which is marvelous, is wonderfully, but I think it, the, the technologies might not have been devised yet which will find uh, that after you've finished the pack of cornflakes, if you pull the, the, the ripcord at the bottom, that rather st stiff bottom of that box off, it inflates and you find not, not an umbrella for one day, but the start of the, of the container that you call a house, as long as you have an arrangement with the next person, that, that that land isn't necessarily owned all the time. And in fact, you're probably putting some money in, in a stack for putting wheels on your house because you haven't decided where to be. Millionaires always do that, and they call wheels money. They, and they've never lived in a slum, even if it's 600 years old. So the, that equation, I think, adds to the other. Contributions, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. It does indeed. Uh, and, and it uh, focuses on, uh, at the end, certainly on one of the interesting problems for economists in talking about houses and consumer durable. Of course, all the other consumer durable houses we've been talking about, whether they be false teeth or television sets, you can move around. And we're used to moving them around. And we have a conception of them as being something we buy probably for a fairly short term, because it will be upgraded, you get a better false teeth or a better colour television, 
to the reading set. But also it doesn't fix itself into real estate, which then locks it into serious problems in terms of the economics of the production of something, if it's then linked into land markets and other things. So the, yeah. there's a very serious that issues with that, but that's a between land and Though we should avoid also perhaps the sort of techno-freak sort of reaction that, uh, that architects go through every now and again to make the sort of the ultimate sort oh, of bubble yeah. that can yeah. float everywhere. And, and there's a te particularly in the AA, a long history of suddenly veering off into, into, into uh, the sort of uh, techno-fantasy world. That's which, why I hope uh, my example is so ridiculous I think, that not even the AA I think, I think your false teeth will, will keep, us, keep us down to uh, earth not the from that. Thing. But I'd like now to, to open it up to, to the audience. We've got a lot of um, ideas being kicked out. There is a roving microphone, uh, which only roves if I roam it. So uh, who would like to come in on? Um, I, I would um, like to suggest that the speakers have been um, considering not so much how architects should be more involved with housing, but what um, part of the housing industry should be industrialized and perhaps how it might be industrialized. Um, and uh, they've therefore been likening it to other industrialized factory produced products like um, transport vehicles and other small mobile objects which hopefully don't have any links to the land um, because that suits industrialization. And if you turn it that way around, instead of um, how can we persuade houses to be more like cars or false teeth, but say uh, what shelter is, uh, what parts of shelter or what shelter could be uh, less connected to the ground. I think, uh, again, Cedric um, mentioned the idea of single um, short-term occupancy dwellings would be one area that one might look at. But I would suggest far more fundamentally one would look at uh, smaller parts of houses or shelters. Um, one would look at um, things like Velux windows, which maybe in anathema to architects, but actually have been very successful. Small elements which could be produced with a um, predictable performance that people would then know what they were buying, uh, which could then be assembled by people maybe not involving architects, maybe involving architects, to be more specific to what they wanted, which could be long-term or short-term, maybe resold if their use had been um, finished on that particular site, could be moved on and sold to another, um, another user um, through loot, um, and might have a longer life uh, than, than the occupant on that site as they moved over the second-hand market in, in, in windows and doors and other elements. Um, it doesn't have to be just a direct link between the site and a dwelling and a user. And I would suggest that one of the areas that haven't been looked at sufficiently in the uh, industrialization of housing is the industrialization of uh, the production of building components um, rather than the whole unit itself, which I would suggest is generally too large to be industrialized, which is generally a reductionist approach and re gets rid of all the joy of making things, which many people enjoy, if not all, and, and more likely in the general population within the family realm. I think I've said enough. Thanks very much. That, that reminds me strongly of the discussions started when Nicholas Habracken in the 70s proposed his idea of supports, yeah. that in fact the production of housing was more about the consumer being, this was just the beginning of the sort of DIY construction uh, production of materials, that, that in fact uh, increasingly the consumer could go out and shop for the components that made their house particularly what they wanted within a much bigger framework that dealt with things like basic services uh, and indeed in that case with real estate in that you bought your slot and then started to build in. Th that's a recurrent theme which hasn't actually been picked up uh, hardly at all in the construction industry, though there have been some examples of that actually being built, particularly in, in Germany. I'm Martin Richardson. Um, it does seem in a way that, thinking specifically of architecture with a capital A perhaps, um, does 
does seem that housing design has uh, achieved a very strange uh, position in this country in, in, uh, in the last 50 years. I mean, first of all, there was uh, uh, modernism was somehow uh, unleashed, like the, the dogs of architecture, the dogs of war, um, uh, with its sort of international detached uh, thoughts and often with uh, disastrous, uh, but not always, uh, results. And there's been this extraordinary... Uh, reaction after these uh, failures, which has sadly sort of um, coincided with what's gone on as politically in the last uh, 15, 20 years. This, this um, extraordinary national uh, nostalgia with its overtones of uh, class and uh, snobbery. And we produce these, uh, these funny buildings which you just don't seem to see in other parts of Europe, let alone further abroad, which are clearly, in fact, such bad value, have such false values, where, in spite of the costs, houses are, are made as far as possible detached, not, not in sensible straight lines, uh, with all these little extra bits and pieces. Often, um, the so-called hard-headed builders are, are awfully soft when it comes to um, the confused internal design. And in terms of simple space, they're a very, very, they're very bad value. Um, uh, what what does uh, concern me? I mean, uh, after this experience, if you like, uh, students have largely, it seems, in schools, fled the scene. I mean, they don't want to get mixed up in this awful, awful uh, nostalgic stuff. And um, I'm sometimes afraid that, that they then will go back into this heady, exciting. Um, these heady, exciting uh, fixes, these extraordinary uh, technological um, uh, fantasies, um, which really, in the end, won't work. I mean, I've been building in, in Holland uh, the last five years or so, and we recently went on a trip to Denmark. And it is so reassuring to see this, uh, Bernard used the word evolutionary, this sort of sensible, central ground uh, where people accept a, a sort of progressive, a progressive modernism, not a modernism with a big capital M, which is in a way unspectacular, very sensible, uh, produces good value and good values often, particularly in, one feels that in, in Denmark where there isn't this, um, we went from a particular uh, a project which was quite um, um, a, a costly one, a, a, a group of um, that's 50 or 60 houses with small gardens which gave, gave, gave on to common green spaces and belonged to doctors, dentists, maybe architects and so on, one of whom inv invited us in. And um, the kitchen was the original kitchen, 25 years old. He'd been there 12 years. And he, and he said, well, this year we're thinking of, of um, doing, upgrading our, our kitchen a bit. And this, I think, was something like putting in new hinges. And it, A, it had been very well made to begin, to begin with. And B, this idea of we've got to have a new kitchen was just absent. And clearly, I mean, uh, it's, it's a two-way thing. I mean, uh, pleasant societies can actually produce pre pleasant buildings. You can design pleasant buildings for pleasanter societies. But clearly, the uh, um, uh, pressure of consumption is quite different. Uh, anyway, these are some thoughts. Thank you. I mean, what I really, sum, to summarize, I just hope that we can return to a sensible, progressive, central uh, line in, in this country. Anyone else want to uh, take up the baton, literally? Uh, Leonard Suskunoglu. Um, I'm an architect and um, someone who's dealt with uh, theoretical science of design and done research in design. I find uh, the problem with, with housing is on one hand in, in, in the 80s uh, and early 90s, I found that the, the schools were increasingly um, looking away from housing uh, as an I interesting architectural project and some kind of elitism um, about whether architecture, uh, housing is architecture or not. Um, unfortunately, that has now come to the point where the housing industry has just ex mainly excluded the architects in, in the whole business and in trying to keep cu um, costs down and, and cutting the costs of housing have uh, tended to 
downgrade the importance of the design element, um, the actual design. But um, I, I suspect that things are slightly changing in, 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 current, uh, in the current atmosphere. Um, that's the first point I'd like to make. The second point is I think that the problem of the scale of um, um, housing projects, um, that has been one of the key problems in, in, uh, the lo in house housing estates has been the problem of scale. Um, and I suspect that partly the fail some of the failures are, are due to the anonymity and uh, um, in different kind of environments that are produced through, through two large sums of uh, houses being built in, in one style, one group, and without necessarily understanding the urban dimension and the urban structure well enough. Um, on the other hand, there is the, that the lack of uh, likelihood, uh, likelihood of an individual uh, household owner employing his own architect and building his own house or getting it done. Um, that is so common in other countries. And that is, again, um, um, leading to, let's say, the, one of the difficulties of uh, the house building industry here. Thank you. Yeah. That, on, on that point, I do think it's, it's an extraordinary convention, no more than that, in this country, that um, housing developers choose to put a house on every plot they sell, unlike um, the convention in most other countries in the world. I think in other countries, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, but it's very common in most countries in the world for people to buy large tracts of land, put in the roads and services, to sell off the plots. It's very good news for architects because they then tend to employ an architect. Then, when we're talking about this evolutionary process, you get actually architects engaged in producing lots of individual houses, so that the thinking is coming through in that way. I, I think it's really quite... I, I, I certainly don't understand, and maybe, maybe you know, um, you can explain. I would have thought, in a competitive environment, that somebody would say, well, let's try it a different way. Let's just buy the land, subdivide it, and sell the plots and see if it goes. Because, you know, anybody who wants to find a housing plot is really very hard put to find one in this country, whereas in almost anywhere else in the world, it would, it would be a routinely easy thing to do. In, in the, in the just, just very briefly, in this very room, <coughs> there were two discussions, and, and the same man said, made the same point um, 10 years between. The first one was on hook. And it was Walter Bohr talking about Hook. And then Walter Bohr was involved with Llewellyn Davis in the, in the Milton Keynes plan. And he's, he talked about the uh, plots that they were selling. And he talked about uh, the problem they'd had. Hook was never built, by the way. It was a GRC plan, a very good plan, but it wasn't, wasn't built. Um, Milton Keynes was built, but in both cases, they were worried, as, were the, uh, as was the architect of Harlow, Freddie Gibbard, um, on how to, to have, this is the old person thing, you see. If, if you're all thinking about buying a house at, 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 between the ages 18 and 21, and then you go off it and go for a lotus and a, a different wife or a different husband, um, that's different. But then they were thinking about, you know, who can we sell these plots to? We'd like to have a mix, an income mix. And in the Milton Keynes plan, uh, the, the larger the plot, uh, the, the more expensive house they expected to be built on it. Now, I, I raised this point when, when they were planning. I said, the smaller the plot, the more expensive house should be built on, because then they could have convenience Economy, they could afford, you know, double glazing and things. And uh, whereas a bigger plot, it should cost less because they spent it on the on the land, but they could uh, wear a wigwam as long as the, 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 the you know, as long as they put on their pajamas in the morning. And think that, that uh, they were a long way away. Now this this is a privacy and ownership of land and the product that that you occupy on the 
land. So they said, oh no, we sell a bigger plot, therefore we get people who will be capable of, of building a grander house and that, that will increase the value of the area. And um, the, the whole business of, of reversing that, that tradition, which actually you see again in the rich, because the rich, very, it's, they're very much blamed, and they should be as well, because they're richer than us. But on the other hand, they, they, they make decisions which, which are terribly sensible in some ways for their, for, yes, no, but for their own well-being. So they, they spend an arm and a leg for a little penthouse in Park Lane because they've worked out the, the rest. They don't use infrastructure. It's even more richly social than that. The whole advantage of, of only having one front door and lots and no... So that is not related in architectural theory very often. When they start talking about the plot and then the resultant building within, and then you being able to determine uh, either the wealth or the aspirations towards wealth of the, the occupant. And so I think that, that uh, I'm all for, if you were saying, I'm all for separation of even uh, intelligent responsibility of the, the nature of, of ownership of land and occupancy of land. Um, I would like to see the occupancy of land, uh, uh, personally, you know, uh, held by, by the nation as a whole and rented out to everyone. Everyone, whether farmers or, you know, because um, we haven't got much of a lifespan anyhow. It's, it's, it, but that's another argument. But the, there was quite good um, talk in, actually, when, when the Labour Party was just about <laughs> to lose it, its, its role as, as governing party in, in the 79, 78, 79, uh, about, uh, uh, I mean, it always crops up, but about the nationalization of land. I mean, use another word. And, um, of course, when they looked at agricultural land, about 95% is, is um, rented anyhow. There's very little freehold land that's actually occupied and farmed by the people who own the land. When you look in the urban land, the insurance companies, it's minute, so it isn't a, a painful tearing our lifeblood away you know, and transferring the, the mortgage to, to a national debt. Anyhow. Um, can, can I just chip in um, yeah. a couple oh, yeah. of points on um, uh, this technology, the way of technology, technological explanations. Um, uh, I think it was Hugo that mentioned land. Whenever I hear land and house building, um, I'm sure my age here a bit, but this little voice comes up in the, um, a, a Kenneth Williams, who's now dead, and it goes, the answer lies in the soil. <laughs> and, um, which was a parody in a 50s um, comedy program, um, which was just say, just taking the mickey out of the experts. You know, you just come up with some good, solid round explanation, and everybody goes off and give it a bit of a raw twist, and we're all happy. Um, in fact, what we see, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad the point was raised earlier on, that in other countries there are better techniques. In other countries there clearly is more architectural input. Not simply architectural input in, the, le in the, the, the final product itself, but also there seems to be a little more conversation between building components manufacturers and architects, which there seems to be um, very little of in, in this country. So we can see differences, but um, we can also see many countries with completely different land ownership systems. You know, 80% of the land in Amsterdam is publicly owned, but um, there isn't that much publicly owned land in the US, for example, and um, yet yeah, you get much, much better systems there. So there seem to be lots of varieties of land system, um, apart from our own, and yet we still have this problem in the UK, and our land system isn't that unique. Our developers and spec builders, in terms of the way they operate, aren't that unique. I think the reason why they build houses more than perhaps happens in other countries um, is a little bit to do with the planning system, but in fact there's an awful lot of um, so-called self-building that takes place anyway, anyway you know, that's where people acquire plots. I have a personal experience of this, and my father um, uh, built a house on a piece of land recently, 
And he was appalled with the building technology, couldn't believe it. He thought, you know, he'd really been careful to master the proper builder and so on, and it looked very impressive. And then Bush in came the subcontractors. Um, you know, Bush, where was the machinery? What? <laughs> and, uh, and he got a handicraft built product, which he's furious about. Um, but um, you can just, just see these sorts of things happening again and again. Similarly in refurbishment. Refurbishment's got nothing to do with land. I mean, okay, it's fixity. But again, is fixity such a problem? You know, there's a rocket that blew up last week. That wasn't fixity as a problem. Mobility can be a problem. Um, it doesn't seem to me you can just point out physical characteristics or land ownership patterns, which, which, are, which are the issue themselves. I do think it's a very, very complex issue, but there's, there is a particularly, and I, I will actually say English characteristic to this, because in fact, um, there have been certain developments in Scotland which indicate that they might be a little more technologically au fait. Uh, for example, Scots housing consumers don't mind timber frame housing, love it, it keeps the wind out. Um, but um, in the UK, you, uh, sorry, in England, English consumers um, think that the house will fall down within three days if they move into a timber framed home. Now, why do we have these peculiar things? Why is it such a southern British uh, peculiarity which we're then exporting to the rest of Britain? Of course, that last case is particularly to do with this question of consumerism. The reason that the English timber frame launch, as it were, collapsed was because of one television program and the very carefully orchestrated uh, debate around the failure of that particular implementation of, of timber frame housing, which was targeted at a particular company, in fact, which just was enough to, uh, it, this is the penalty, of, in a way, of, of moving into consumerism and yet not knowing how to handle the media, in, in that it was actually a, a, a gross misrepresentation which actually killed timber frame housing in England for it's still dead. It's still dead. You had a comment at the back. Yes, I, I'm Anna Bowman, um, and I work for a housing association, West Hampstead. And actually, we've started to use timber frame um, because the things that are important to our tenants are to avoid miniature housing, to have flexibility and adequate space because a lot of people don't have jobs and are trying to work from home. And the only way we can achieve that is not by doing traditional one-off rehabs, but keeping the facade and doing a timber-framed build behind where you get better sort of standards of insulation. And it, it was an architect that came to us with this concept, and we've worked with Langs to develop it. And a number of housing associations are now using this technique because it actually does, oper um, does offer some things that you wouldn't get through traditional rehab. Um, so I think there are some changes, and I'd also say that in temporary housing, which our organization specializes in, our development manager is saying it's like for him working now in New York 20 years ago when he worked as a building laborer, because he's finding that some builders are coming up with sort of um, techniques which enable him to treat the inside as if it was a void rather than just doing patch and repair. So I think there are some um, uh, building component manufacturers that are introducing the potential for new techniques in social housing as well as architects who are doing it. And it obviously is good news and, and it's still at the very beginning stage um, but I think it's something to watch. Yes, yeah, so John Mason. Uh, I'd like to take up three points. First of all, I, I think Mike Ball is being unhelpful because the tendency, the drift of what he's saying is this is almost a cultural problem. It's a problem of the consumer. It's not a problem of the consumer. It's a problem of supply, which is talked quite rightly highlighted as an area of great uh, a difficulty in the English housing market. And we see this if we compare him to the contribution made by the second panel speaker. I'd like to draw attention to his, because his, I think, has been the most helpful contribution along with my colleague on the left here that's been made tonight. He said, um, what are we really saying here? His point was that no one, no one in the professions has seriously thought about this problem. And what this does is turn the assumption behind 
the, this evening's uh, session on its head. Right? What we have isn't a question of these uh, tremendously committed people on, say, the housing panel of the RIBA or in the school here working terribly hard to solve a terribly difficult problem. After all, there is nothing really complex about building a house in itself. We have to see that at the outset of this discussion, otherwise we get nowhere. So we've not got all these tremendously committed, hard-working, socially aware, responsible people working their guts out on this problem. It's simply that the, they have never addressed the problem. Therefore, we, we have to ask the question, uh, are we prepared to entrust, uh, are we prepared to trust the claims that have been made on tonight on behalf of, say, the RIBA housing panel, or are we not prepared to trust those claims? Right? And I'd like to just put this in a historical context of the school. If we, if we, if we rule out the, if we brush aside the, the, the example, the honorable example of Walter Siegel, the last person, to my knowledge, to seriously address the problem of building materials and building methods at the Architectural Association School was Professor Pite in 1920, shortly after the school took the lease on this very building and moved here. Professor Pite was an architect, and he was the architect of what is possibly the most uh, significant commercial Edwardian building in London, the chartered, uh, the chartered accountant's headquarters off Moorgate. But he was also, more important than that, although the talk he gave was actually here in this very building, he was also a professor of building at the Brixton School of Building. There is no Brixton School of Building today. And one of the questions we might ask, if it was a good old-fashioned uh, meeting, we'd want a resolution. And the resolution which I think I would put forward to the meeting, which may not be very popular, is that we ask the governors of the Bartlett School and the Architectural Association School to close down both institutions as a contribution to a socially responsible housing and to an effective housing policy. <laughs> and this is where I have to come back to Mike Ball because he's not come quite clean with us tonight. And I think we should return to the question, if we take the architect out of your talk, out of your problem altogether, or we put the architect into your problem, I'm not quite sure at the end of this which it is, would it make a blind bit of difference? And my serious and wholehearted contention is that it wouldn't. And therefore the architect is irrelevant, the architect is a parasite within this field, and the worst form of parasite, which is an unnecessary parasite. Thanks. Does that stimulate any reaction? From <laughs> <laughs> but before we all come back on it, which I'm sure we will. Can I, can I make just one oh, comment before yeah. we go? Yeah. Um, I, I work in a building that's actually called the Brixton School of Building. <laughs> it just happens to be part of South Bank University now. <laughs> so it's, it's still around. <laughs> oh, no, right. Yeah. Is there anyone immediately want to come back on that? Um, I'm in my early 20s. My name's Joel, and uh, I'm from New Zealand. Um, I'm over on a two year working holiday with an aim to return to study architecture in New Zealand early next year. Um, immediately my first impression is coming to England, um, you could say a, probably a, a raw impression of English architects, is that they seem very separated from um, the public in a lot of respects. And talking to people, you think, um, oh yeah, to visit your local architect would be like visiting the dentist to consult on your house or something. You know, it would be something you just wouldn't do if you didn't have to. Um, that's basically the first point, and in, the, in that way, I think that they have to try and put their egos apart and maybe their flair for design and whatnot, just to come down to earth a bit, just to just to re reach the public and and perhaps convey, you know, what goes on in the building industry. Um, so that people can grasp, you know, what needs to be done and what they can do. The second thing is, um, there has been a lot of debate. Of, I mean, I haven't read much since I've been over here, but on the actual role of the architect, um, 
is an architect allowed to have so much responsibility that um, not only is he design a house but for a person um, that spends £150,000 on, but also takes on a role of a marketer to inspire people to um, buy a house which um, makes them an individual or sort of conveys you know, a different colour or coming back to that car thing again. Um, and as this gentleman just pointed out before, you know, does the architect have a role in all this newfound um, sort of development that's going to go on? Um, it's again, it's an ego problem I detect that the architects want to be involved in every single thing that goes on, um, from initial client um, contact to social urbanism. You know, they want to be involved in everything. Um, my point is, and my view is, that an architect um, really should be concentrating on um, going back to the start, just contacting people, inspiring people to to um, do something different. That's it. To take up uh, the point there about, about uh, schools of architecture and, and whether uh, the Bartlett VA should be closed down, um, I, I, don't, I think that I mean, if architects are irrelevant, there'd be no relevance in closing down those two schools of architecture anyway. But, but <laughs> what, what is, uh, what, what, what is uh, debated in those schools of architecture is architecture, to some extent. And you know, for me, uh, architecture isn't some sort of, uh, it's quite, in some sense, it's quite simply defined. And it is, uh, it's actually looking at the whole picture and the totality of the situation in a way that is, that, that no piecemeal picture of it uh, can ever do. And any, in any field of design. I mean, for example, like there's, com there's the architecture of the, of the motherboard in, the, in a computer, in, 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 in chips. There's, and that is about having an, in mind a structure which is sort of an overriding and a, which, has, which has some strong connection with ideas which are not to do with immediate pragmatic decisions, immediate pragmatic reality. It's about a bigger idea about the world and how that might impinge on it. And the world includes, uh, you know, dirty things and clean things and weight of things and lightness of things and cost of things, and all those things. That's the only problem. Now, innovation, I mean, in, in a way, we wouldn't be here probably talking about this if Michael hadn't highlighted innovation as a central fact. I think there's a slight confusion about when we talk about innovation in housing. There are several kinds of innovation. There is, there's actually some, something that, that all architects can, or architecture students, or those who study architecture in whatever way, can be very much engaged in at the moment, which is... We, we, we live in a new kind of world. This world is just changing very much. There are new, different cultures coexisting together in this country, and we need houses that reflect that, and houses which are adaptable, and take into account all these different things in a way that uh, standard house types just don't. I mean, it's, it's actually no good having pattern books and following historical precedents, because you know, they're, they're, they're quite hit and miss. They do work sometimes.